Oh my god. Are you fucking, fucking cheating, cheating on me? me? What? what? This, this isn't, isn't funny. funny. Okay, okay, stop. stop. I'm, I'm serious. serious. Stop, stop copying, copying me. me. Stop, stop pretending, pretending like you know everything. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Dom Griffin, I'm a film critic, and you're watching the Armchair Auteur. Uh, it's an ongoing video series where I talk about and review films. If you're the kind of person who likes movie reviews and pop culture analysis, please consider subscribing. Today we're reviewing the film Palm Springs, which just debuted on Friday on Hulu. Uh, it stars Annie Samberg and Krista Milioti as a couple who are trapped uh, in the same day in a time loop a la Groundhog Day at a wedding. Now, uh, you may have heard about this movie at the beginning of this year because it was like a big darling at Sundance. Uh, Neon and Hulu like co-bought it for the platform uh, for like close to like twenty million dollars or something. It's like a like a huge amount of money to spend acquiring a picture at Sundance. I think it may have broken like the record for highest like most expensive acquisition. I bring that up to say that on the channel recently we've been talking a lot about grading movies on a curve, uh, given that because of COVID nineteen and the pandemic and everything new movies are not coming out in theaters. Theaters are still not open. It's the middle of July and like we're still watching movies at home. And as a result, we tend to look at movies and judge them somewhat differently now that we're just like throwing them on in the background while we're stuck at home. I posit, however, that Palm Springs is like the only movie of this year that really truly benefits from coming out during this crisis if for no other reason that it actually makes the movie itself better. Not just the viewing experience, but it actually enriches the story that you're watching. So as I said before, the movie is basically about two people who are trapped in a time loop, like Groundhog Day and other movies of the Groundhog Day genre, uh, and they're trapped at a wedding at Palm Springs. And the movie follows them being trapped in this situation together, looping the same day over and over again, trying to get out of it, trying to accept it, trying to, to deal with it. Uh, and it's essentially a, a gussied up, high concept rom-com. It's like the perfect movie to storm Sundance with because uh, visually and everything, it feels like a typical kind of like low budget indie movie, uh, but the concept makes the movie feel bigger and larger. Now, before I get too deep into the movie, and I'm not really gonna do very, there's not gonna be like spoilers, outside of spoiling the premise of the movie, if you call that a spoiler, I'm not gonna get into the actual like nitty gritty of the plot, I'm just gonna talk about the mechanics and the story. But before we do that, I wanna point out two big things about this movie that have annoyed me from other reviews I've seen of the film. Thing one is that I keep seeing people calling it a Lonely Island movie, and like it's not a Lonely Island movie, it's not like pop star, never stop, never stopping. Uh, it's not written or directed by any of the members of The Lonely Island. Like, the guys all produce the movie and Andy Samberg's the star, but, like, it's just weird calling it that because it's not. So stop doing that. Secondly, I keep seeing people criticizing the movie for the fact that they feel that Samberg and Miliati have no chemistry together, uh, which I think is just wrong and incorrect. I mean, obviously, that's like the subjective thing, but the movie works so well because the two do have chemistry. They have, like, odd chemistry, and it's relative to the situation that their characters are in, uh, but to say that like, they have no chemistry, I think, is stupid. So stop saying that. So one of the things that I really like about Palm Springs is that it is a new entry into the ever-growing genre of time loop movies and time loop TV series and, and stuff. And it works uh, really well within that genre uh, by sort of accepting that this is a movie that is being shown to people who have seen Groundhog Day and every other movie like Groundhog Day. So it doesn't have to spend a good chunk of its runtime setting up the premise and explaining it to you and the mechanics and all the rules. It can just kind of hit the ground running with you know, signifiers to explain to you what's going on relatively quickly and just get into the situation. Uh, it's unique in that it begins with one of the characters already in the status quo. Like, Andy Samberg's character, when we meet him, has already been stuck in this loop for who knows how long. So, from Jump, you have, like, a main character who just, it, it, this is happening to him. You don't have to have that whole section of, like, teaching him that he's in a loop. And then, once Miliati gets stuck in the loop, she already has someone that can explain it to her very quickly, rather than, like, her being the audience surrogate who has to learn it all. Like, it just sort of allows you, the audience, to know. You know how these movies work. It is also a movie that doesn't have to get so bogged down by, like, the time loop genre's need to create, like, background gags and stuff based around the circumstance. Like, all the background characters in this movie, uh, with the exception of Connor O'Malley. Oh, this place is get, get, get off me! Hey, get off me! I should have never have left the Great Lake! The brilliant Connor O'Malley. Each of these characters, other than him, uh, are rendered like real flesh and blood people with real actual human emotions and feelings, and a lot of their realness, so to speak, allows them to represent the emotional baggage that Miliati's character is constantly kind of trying to, like, escape being trapped in this day, uh, and also some of the type of stuff that Samberg's character is also just, like, pretending isn't real. So there are elements where the characters interact with those background characters 
through time loop maneuvers, but it's not like Groundhog Day or certain other movies, or like Happy Death Day, for instance, where there's a bunch of little gags that we keep seeing over and over again perfected and played with. It's not as gag-heavy. It sort of sidesteps all that, and that sort of allows it to be a little bit more, I don't want to say realistic, but the feeling of the story is a little bit more realistic because the time loop genre metaphor isn't being used uh, solely to play in that space. It's like we're playing in this space so we can tell the specific story, if that makes sense. But speaking of other Groundhog Day movies, where <laughs> Groundhog Day is like a movie about a guy who's like kind of a piece of shit, and then it literally takes living the same day over and over again for, I don't know what, like, Wolfman's got Nards theorized, like, what, thousands of years? Like, he literally lives his day forever in order to actually change and grow. Other time loop movies kind of play with it in different ways. Like, Edge of Tomorrow, like, uses it for, like, a sci fi action piece, and it's a really great movie. I think about, like, Happy Death Day, which does it for horror, uh, and is a little bit cutesier in the way it employs the tricks and stuff. But I feel like Palm Springs actually probably gets the most influence from Russian Doll, the uh, Natasha Leone Netflix series that also uses time loop theory, uh, but in a more episodic format, and also with different rules, so it's not so much about, like, reliving the same day as much as it is, like, going back to the same, like, bug point, like, in a video game. Russian Doll was able to use that concept and that structure uh, to tell, like, a deeper story about trauma and, like, what we as people can do for another and looking out for each other and, like, human connection and stuff. And then through that, it was able to really play with the genre a lot. I think of the different time loop uh, projects that have come out in Groundhog's Day's wake over the last, like, 20 years or whatever. Or more? How old is Groundhog Day? 30 years? Of those different movies and TV shows and concepts, I think really that... Russian Doll probably stretched that genre like the most and uh, played with the conventions a lot and really opened up uh, the field for something like Palm Springs to work. Uh, Palm Springs is a similar thing where it does play a little more broadly with like the concept of being stuck in a time loop by having there being more than one person in the loop with you and then what that means and how that changes uh, your relationships and your feelings and your emotions and stuff. Uh, only here, Palm Springs is much more straight-up romantic comedy. Whereas I think Russian Doll is dealing with, like, a sort of deeper level trauma and how, like, those things, like, continue to affect us throughout life and, like, how we need other people in order to, like, help us heal and stuff. I think that Palm Springs is aiming a little bit uh, lower in the sense that it's much more about using the concept of the time loop of reliving the same day to make a commentary about the idea of marriage and monogamy as a whole. And for romantic comedy, that's actually a great concept. It allows for you to do a lot of the same things that happen in a romantic comedy like you can get the meat cute and then like the you know in a love story you're trying to figure out how to keep two characters apart and what it is that stops them from wanting to get together you can still do all those same screenwriting mechanical things in a time loop romantic comedy but specifically this is a film that is exploring what it's like with these two people who are the only sort of the only two people that are stuck in a specific situation what it's like for them to interact with each other when there's like no way out there's no way for them to get out of this routine now if this movie had come out this summer, as intended, uh, from, you know, Hulu and Neon, and they had had an actual theatrical run before ending up on Hulu, this would be, like, a perfectly fine, charming romantic comedy, right? Like, it's, you know, you got a guy who falls for a girl because, like, they're stuck in the situation, and the girl doesn't feel like the guy actually wants her specifically. She thinks he's just settling for her because they're there, and then they both have all this outside baggage about their relationships with people outside of this loop. And, like, yeah, that's, like, charming, you know? And, like, if you would release this in theaters, it would probably be pretty strong at uh, a box office of the art houses and stuff. It would probably be sort of, like, a 500 Days of Summer level, like, hit, you know, where people like it. Um, but I feel like the main thing people would have gotten out of that movie had it been released in this alternate world where we weren't all trapped because of a, a virus. Uh, I think that version of Palm Springs that people would have seen would be somewhat more boring. Because I feel like in some ways... The takeaway from the movie would be primarily about how Andy Samberg's character is like the typical romantic comedy man-child. He's like a guy who's afraid of commitment and like growing up and accepting reality and stuff. And then Miliati's character would be seen as much more mature because she deals with her own issues and then wants to move forward in life and not be trapped in the same cycle. Like that's a thing that we've seen before, <laughs> quite frankly. I think most romantic comedies are about like smart, mature women uh, who then settle for, like, idiot losers. So, like, that's not very special. However, watching the movie, like, now, in the coronavirus world, the movie gets all this extra dimensionality just because of the context it existed. Now, I'm aware that a lot of people have sort of moved away from corona 
thought, right? Like many people no longer think about coronavirus and COVID-19. Many people have gone back to work and like their lives are still affected by it. But so many people are just pretending like everything's back to normal now. But for many of us who still do not leave the house, whose jobs have not come back because of the situation of the economy and, and all the cases rising here in the States and stuff, living in quarantine, living in uh, a life where like time has somewhat stood still, it's a weird thing. It's not like regular life anymore. Even though you get up every day and you live and breathe and you eat and you do all this stuff, it's like you're living outside of reality. It feels like time is not moving forward. Some days time feels like it's moving much faster than it is. Some days it takes for a day takes like forever. You just feel like the whole day is like a year. And other days you're like, fuck, did I just wake up? I'm already going back to sleep. This is already over. Well, do it again tomorrow. Like it, it really is like Groundhog Day and everyone with their like complaining sourdough bread making memes on Facebook and stuff constantly calls it that like oh it's Groundhog Day the same day every day uh and this movie really does capture what that feeling is like it's sort of like a gift and a curse like in some ways quarantine life feels freeing right like for some people it's like hey I'm not going to my stupid job that I hate I can do whatever I want I can like read more I can like do more yoga and then for some people it's like oh my god I need the structure of real actual life for my life to have meaning what am I doing every day I can't do this all the time. Time feels more elastic. It stretches, it pulls taut, and I feel like this movie, and Sandberg's performance in particular, more so than Miliati's, really does capture like that roller coaster. Here's this guy who like, we don't even know much about his actual life in the story outside of the loop. Like the movie does wrestle a lot with like Krista Miliati's issues with her family and her past and the thing that she keeps waking up to that she regrets. Whereas Sandberg's character, we see that he's in this like unhappy relationship with a girl who's about to cheat on him and break up with him. But there's not, like, a sense about what is his regular life like. We don't really know what he does, what, he, what his things are like for when he goes home. And there's a serenity in his accepting the time loop. Accepting that he's going to be stuck at this wedding every day forever. And he just doesn't care. Like, he talks about not caring about, like, the financial side of things. And, like, he doesn't have to worry about being poor or whatever and different stuff. Like, that rings really true. You know what I mean? I mean, most of us actually do really still consider being poor and, like, being fucked financially. But... You know, it does still feel like you're in a bubble. And this story is about living in a bubble. And what is it like living in a bubble with one other person? And what does that do for, how does it change your relationship? And I think that is an experience that a lot of people are living right now. A lot of people are not quarantined alone. A lot of people are quarantined in a couple. In a weird way, I actually think the movie deals with the concept of life and death somewhat more fascinatingly than, you know, the other day I reviewed The Old Guard and I read the comics The Old Guard is based on. And I was really in that kind of headspace. And that's a story about immortality that talks about how life, if you're living it just forever and you can't die, feels like it has no meaning because life needs like a beginning and end, right? Like it has to, there has to be an end game. It's like if you're writing a show that just ends on, it's like if you're writing a show that has like 12, 15 seasons, you don't know when the end's going to happen. Episodes start to feel meaningless because it's just going on and on and on. You need like an ending to define things and that's like kind of what death is, right? Um, the, I feel like that's something the Old Guard comic did better than the Old Guard movie. But here, Palm Springs is exploring similar ideas. Like, if you cannot wake up tomorrow, if you cannot move to the next day, like, what is, the, then, like, how do you grow? What is, what is growth? It's really harrowing, honestly. And it doesn't dig as deeply into, like, the nihilism of the time loop theory thing, like, the way Groundhog Day does at certain parts in the second act. It teases, like, it's more in, in line with the concept of the part of Inception where Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, what's her face, the chick that whispers in every movie, like them, like being in, in like limbo forever, and it's like they were down there for like fifty years together. It seems like it's something like in that headspace, but like obviously a lot lighter and less heady. But that makes it interesting, and this is all not stuff the filmmakers intended. I don't believe anyone behind Palm Springs knew this was going to happen and knew they would make their movie seem deeper and maybe more dramatically powerful than it really is. But context does matter, and watching the movie today. It is an opportunity for, I think, a lot of us to look up at the screen and watch something that's supposed to be sort of a diversionary romantic comedy actually feels sort of comforting because it does explore this specific moment and how we're all feeling, and maybe not all of us, but a lot of us, uh, and, and what we're doing and how we're wrestling with that. And I think that's cool. I don't think that, like, this is just a throwaway romantic comedy and we're only pretending it's more special because of the situation that we're in watching it. I genuinely think the situation that we're in reflecting it makes it better uh, story I, I think it just makes it better. I'm not going to pretend like just because the filmmakers didn't intend to tell the story in this way that it does not affect us in the same way. It's one of the best watching experiences I've had all year. I watched it twice and it still holds up on the second viewing and I think it's something that people, if you're like not interested in watching because you think it's going to be like a mild trifle, like it actually I think has 
has a little more power than that. So yeah, that's my take on Palm Springs. I think it's definitely one of the better movies to watch that's currently available to stream. Maybe we wouldn't have given as much of a shit about it if it came out in theaters for a few weeks uh, and like, you know, did gangbusters at like your local art house. But I, I think it's pretty special and it's really, really good. I think if nothing else, if you don't want to see it for any other reason, it is very much worth it for Andy Samberg's performance. There are a lot of people I know that just actively don't like that guy. I've always had a soft spot for him. I think this is his best work. And it's really good and it's really fun. Thank you guys for watching. As always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you enjoy this content, I put out videos like this every week. Please consider subscribing. Hit the little bell icon to get notifications when I put out new content. Uh, thank you guys for supporting and watching the channel and watching me ramble all the time. I hope everyone's doing okay. I hope you're staying safe. Uh, I will have new videos out soon. And I hope you guys are all wearing your masks.